IB Bio Plant Biology Part 4 will have its primary focus on plant growth, including the hormones that influence growth. As well, this movie will squeeze in a short section on adaptations of plants to desert habitats or habitats with saline soils. The essential idea is plants adapt growth to environmental conditions. Here is an outline of all the available movies for plant biology, topic 9 in the IB syllabus for HL students only. Use this slide to find the movie you need for review. This movie is focused here. Through the first three movies, we've repeatedly looked at cross-sections of leaf and stem. Movie part 5 will examine the cross-section of a root. But this diagram, one I've shown you before, also displays regions of active cell division, regions of growth. The plant tissue of active cell division and growth is called meristematic tissue. The meristematic tissue at the growing tips of the plant are called apical meristem. Apical meristem. Here is an IB syllabus statement. Define meristematic tissue. Meristematic tissue would be regions of undifferentiated cells with active cell division, mitosis, for growth. This is the apical shoot meristem, and this is the apical root meristem. Here are two IB syllabus statements. State that undifferentiated cells in the meristems of plants allow indeterminate growth in plants. Describe the growth at apical regions of a plant, including the development of leaves, as resulting from cell division. It means mitosis. Plants are unique relative to animals. As they develop, they grow in two directions, toward the sun and toward the center of the earth. As well, plants retain undifferentiated tissue throughout their life that allows them to grow and grow and grow. This is indeterminate growth. Undifferentiated cells in the meristems of plants allow indeterminate growth in plants. And growth at these apical regions of a plant include the development of leaves, all resulting from cell division, mitotic cell division. Meristematic tissue is composed of undifferentiated cells, much like stem cells, that serve to grow new leaves and to extend the shoot and root by active cell division. You've probably had the experience of placing an onion into water, as you can see here. The shoot grows and the roots grow. An entirely new plant can be generated. Mitosis and cell division in the shoot and root apex provide the cells needed for the extension of the stem and the development of leaves. You should remember from our study of cell division that we examined mitosis in onion root tips. We were viewing mitosis in apical meristem of the root. So that leads us to these IB syllabus statements. State that plant hormones control growth in the shoot apex. State the role of auxin as a plant hormone involved in growth. Plants have hormones that influence various events. Auxin and gibberellin are both important in stem elongation. Ethylene is important in fruit ripening and leaf drop. And these are just a few examples. Keep in mind that auxin plays a role in the elongation of stems and roots. Auxin changes the rate of stem elongation. Cells within the stem get longer relative to others under the influence of varying auxin concentrations. Auxin concentrations vary due to diffusion and active transport. Here are plant hormones by name and by structure and the location in the plant where they can be found. Auxin's primary role is elongation of stems and roots. Having introduced the top IB syllabus statement on this slide, we can introduce the other two IB syllabus statements seen here. State that plants respond to the environment by tropisms. Define the term tropism. 
A tropism is a growth response by part of a plant to a stimulus arriving from one direction. Phototropism is response by the leaves of the plant to light. The shoots of the plant bend toward the light. Geotropism is a response by the roots, in this case to gravity. The roots grow in the direction of gravitational pull. Hydrotropism is a response by the roots of the plant to respond to the presence of water. The roots of the plant grow toward the water. Thigmotropism is a response by the stems of the plant to contact or touch. The stems of the plant bend toward the contact point, ultimately to wrap around the object. Tropic responses can be positive if the growth occurs toward the stimulus, as in phototropism seen here, or the response is negative if the growth is away from the stimulus. In the case of geotropism on the right, the stem of the plant bends away from the gravitational force. Now roots, as I showed you in the last slide, display a positive response to gravity growing toward the gravitational pull. So all of that brings us to this IB syllabus statement. Explain the role of auxin in the control of plant growth using phototropism as an example. Remember, auxin is a hormone that controls growth at the apex of the plant, the shoot apex, and the root apex. Remember, phototropism is the growth of a plant in response to light as an external stimulus arriving from one direction. Auxin is synthesized by the apical meristem of the plant. In other words, auxin is produced at the growing tip. When the sun is directly overhead, growth along the stem is uniform as auxin concentrations are equally distributed on both sides of the stem. But when the sun arrives at an angle, auxin concentrations are not uniform. Auxin is actively moved by pumps to the side of the stem with less light, causing cells on this side of the stem, the side with less light, to elongate. The elongation of the cells on this side of the stem causes the stem to bend toward the light. When sunlight is directly overhead, auxin is evenly distributed through the shoot of the plant and the growth of the plant is uniform. But when the sunlight strikes the plant at an angle, auxin is actively moved away from the lit side, the cells on the shaded side elongate, and this cell elongation results in a bending of the shoot toward the light. Now, auxin is actively moved by auxin efflux pumps that actively transport the auxin to affect the concentration gradients that we can see in this diagram with auxin concentration being higher on the shaded side of the plant. So that naturally brings us to these two IB syllabus statements. Describe the role of auxin efflux pumps in establishing concentration gradients of auxin in plant tissue. State that auxin influences cell growth rates by changing the pattern of gene expression. Imagine a column of cells along the stem of a plant with uniform concentrations of auxin throughout the cells. But when light arrives from an angle direction, auxin is pumped by active transport efflux pumps across the stem, as you can see on the left and right images in this diagram. And it depends on the direction of the stimulus. Could you state the direction of light for the left and right images of phototropism that we see here. Now the efflux pumps establish an auxin gradient with more auxin on one side than the other, more on one side than the other. The cells with greater concentrations of auxin elongate, causing the stem to bend. Auxin efflux pumps establish concentration gradients of auxin in plant tissue, 
And remember, auxin changes the pattern of gene expression and stimulates the pumping of hydrogen ions out of cells. In this diagram, you can see the auxin being moved from one cell to the other and from one cell to the other. Auxin is received by a receptor, and the arrival of auxin stimulates the production of growth proteins. Remember, auxin influences cell growth rates by changing the pattern of gene expression. As well, the arrival of auxin results in more active pumping of hydrogen ions out of the cell. I'll speak more about this in a slide or two. The arrival of auxin into the cell stimulates proton pumps that serve to change the pH in the cell wall, loosening the cellulose fibers. When the cellulose fibers in the wall loosen, cell elongation can occur. The uptake of water with the loosened cellulose fibers allows the cell to stretch, elongate. Auxin also changes the pattern of gene expression, resulting in protein production, proteins related to cell growth. Starting here, you can see that hydrogen ions are being pumped out of the cell into the cell wall region. The changing pH influences enzymes that serve to cross-cut linked polysaccharide fibers. The cellulose fibers loosen. As the cell takes on water, the cell elongates. Auxin stimulates proton pumps. Hydrogen ions are pumped out of the cell into the cell wall region. This lowers the pH of the cell wall region. This causes enzymes to break cross-linking polysaccharides. The cellulose fibrils can slide, allowing expansion, and the cell elongates. A set of clever experiments were conducted investigating the effects of auxin. Now remember, auxin is synthesized in the apical meristem, the shoot tip. Now the tip of a plant was cut, excised, and placed on an auger cube, and the auxin diffused into the auger cube. The tip was then discarded while the auger cube was placed on a stem that had no tip. Now notice that there's no light in this diagram. Auxin caused the stem to grow. When the auger cube was offset, the stem curved according to the position of the cube, all without light. Auxin has since been extracted and identified as the hormone causing phototropism. Now, thigmotropism is a tropism where the plant turns or bends in response to a touch stimulus. Could you guess which side of the stem elongates upon contact with the surface? Take a guess about where auxin concentrations might be highest. See me in class if you're not sure about your hypothesis. Interestingly, auxins, seen here as little black dots, appear to inhibit cell elongation in root tissue, resulting in cells that elongate on the upper side of the root, causing the root to bend in the direction of gravitational pull. Well, in any case, remember that auxin efflux pumps establish concentration gradients of auxin in plant tissue and that auxin influences cell growth rates by changing the pattern of gene expression. So let's shift gears slightly with this IB syllabus statement. Describe the micropropagation of plants using tissue from the shoot apex, nutrient agar gels, and growth hormones. In this photograph, we can see the industrial production of date palm using the shoot apex with undifferentiated meristem tissue. The shoot apical meristem tissue has been placed on nutrient gels infused with hormones, auxin, and gibberellin. Micropropagation is easy with plants because of the undifferentiated meristematic tissue at the apical regions of the plant. Tissue samples can be cut and placed in bulk on nutrient agar, nutrient gels, that are infused with hormones such as auxin and gibberellin. The sample can be washed to remove any viruses. This would result in virus-free plantlets. 
the micropropagation of virus-free plants can be conducted on an industrial scale. New varieties can be generated and the number of individuals of rare species can be increased. Here's the syllabus statement. State that micropropagation can be used for the rapid bulking up of new varieties or the production of virus-free strains of existing varieties and the propagation of orchids and other rare species. Micropropagation can be used on an industrial scale for the rapid bulking up of new varieties or the production of virus-free strains of existing varieties. Micropropagation can be used on an industrial scale for the rapid bulking up of new varieties or the production of virus-free strains of existing varieties. Micropropagation can be used for the rapid bulking up of orchids and other rare species. Micropropagation can be used for the rapid bulking up of orchids and other rare species. The last IB syllabus statement of this movie relates to the essential idea for this movie, which is plants adapt their growth to environmental conditions. Now the syllabus statement is outline adaptations of plants that help reduce transpiration serving to conserve water in deserts or saline soils. Now a xerophyte is a plant with certain physical structures that are adapted for dry conditions. In order for plants to be successful in very dry environments, they must conserve water. As you might imagine, limiting water loss might limit photosynthesis, and so it does. Growth rates in deserts are quite low. Maybe you can see the issue. Photosynthesis requires carbon dioxide, so stomata must be open for photosynthesis. But when stomata are open, transpiration results in water loss. In other words, terrestrial plants must balance carbon dioxide uptake with water loss. Plants in very dry environments are well adapted to conserve water. Plants that live in wet environments need less regulation of water. Thus, transpiration rates for those plants can, on average, be higher. Let's look at adaptations that serve to conserve water in dry environments or environments with saline soils that draw water from the plant roots. This graph plots root water uptake against soil water potential, and as you move to the right on the x-axis, soil water potential becomes more and more and more negative. Saline soils have low or more negative water potentials relative to non-saline soils. Saline soils result in less water uptake by a plant relative to non-saline soils. Thus, saline soils would promote adaptations to conserve water. There are many adaptations to reduce water loss by plants, and those adaptations include reduced leaves or reduced surface area of leaves, a low growth form, water storage tissue, shedding the leaves seasonally, very deep roots, waxy cuticles, reduced stomata, and the C4 and CAM photosynthetic pathways. Now these two pathways do reduce water loss, but I covered these when we studied photosynthesis so I won't discuss them here. Let's take a look at the other adaptations. Low growth form seen in this barrel cactus and water storage tissue would be typical of xerophytes. The pleated nature of the saguaro cactus seen on the right allows the plant to expand when water becomes available. Now the leaves on both species have been highly reduced over evolutionary time and are now seen as spines. The spines serve to deter herbivores who would find these plants to be a good source of water in the desert. With reduced leaves, the stems of the cactus conduct photosynthesis. The cacti, as seen in this image, also have a very low surface area to volume ratio. Hopefully that's obvious to you. Thus water loss is reduced. The stem is thick as water storage tissue and the stem is photosynthetic. The leaves have evolved into spines, reducing the exposed surface area, reducing the amount of water lost to transpiration. Many xerophytes are succulent, meaning thickened stems that serve to store water, and xerophytes have a smaller surface area to volume ratio, thus less exposed surface area 
over which transpiration would occur. Xerophytes, even with reduced leaves, will shed them seasonally to avoid dehydration in those particularly difficult seasons. They shed leaves during the hottest, driest months of the year. This is a photo I took of baobab trees in Madagascar. The growth form of the trees shows reduced canopy of leaves, and the trunk is quite fleshy, typical of tissue that might store water. Deep roots also serve as an adaptation to obtain scarce water in a desert or where salts have accumulated close to the surface of the soil. Waxy cuticles or a reduced number of stomata would also serve to reduce transpiration. Xerophytes often display a leaf form where the lower tissue layers have indentations or pits within which are the stomata. Let me be clear, this is not the stoma. The stomata are along the lower epidermis here. The space within the pit becomes very humid, making the diffusion gradient for water less steep. Less water is lost to transpiration. The hairs within the pit further restrict airflow within the pit, which further reduces transpiration. Here is a drawing of a xerophytic leaf showing the pit and the exact location of the stoma. The hairs within the pit restrict airflow, thus maintaining a humid condition within the pit, reducing transpiration. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio Plant Biology Part 4, Growth and Hormones.